Hello, guys. Welcome back to the No Food Rules News. If you are new, this is a episode I put out every single Thursday where I round up stories from the past week that have to do with food, nutrition, body image. If you are new, new here, hi, I'm Colleen. I am a non-diet registered dietitian, and this is our casual chatty episode of the week, like I said, where I round up different pop culture news stories and just kind of chat about them. I've been doing this for a few months now on my Instagram stories, and I've been honestly figuring out all of the tech stuff. It is a totally different setup from doing typical YouTube videos, so... We're ready to release it into the whole YouTube part of the internet. So welcome if this is your first episode. I cannot wait to hear what you think about it. These are just super fun, laid back. I want you to grab a cup of coffee, grab a snack, just kind of have it on in the background and get some updates on things that have been happening in the past week. And just like I said, fun, casual. This is not a replacement for my typical YouTube videos. I actually have one coming Next week, I went to a wedding last weekend, and I asked you guys what kind of videos you wanted to see, and you wanted a mix of vlog, but also like educational, so that's what we've got going on. I vlogged kind of the pre-wedding, um, and then like when we were, a little bit of when we were there, and then I'm going to really talk about food FOMO, so like the fear of missing out, like what do I do if I'm never going to get this food again? I just want to eat it all then. What if I eat past fullness? We're going to talk about it all next week. So these videos are just kind of in addition, like I said, a fun thing to do during the week for us to just kind of chat. I feel like there's always things that I want to talk about, but they don't really have a good place. So this is kind of our time to do that. So I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Drop a comment and let me know, especially if you're new and you haven't seen these before. I would love to get your take. So like I said, we are going to round up some stories. I collected five, typically I collect about five um, for the week. We're going to kind of run through them and then I'm going to share some thoughts on them. So Let's hop right into it, guys. It is a Thursday morning. Let's get on the ball. Story number one that we have this week is titled, I tried the 75 hard challenge and was hospitalized for water poisoning. I have so many things to say about this. Michelle so-and-so began the 75 hard challenge nearly two weeks ago. She followed the rigid guidelines, which includes following a strict diet with no alcohol or cheat meals, participating in two workouts per day, and consuming a gallon of water for 75 days. But it landed her in the hospital with water poisoning. She said she didn't know what to do in her dire scenario. She was weighing the option of taking a rest day and listening to her body. But here's the catch. If you skip a day with a 75 hard, then you have to go start the challenge from square one. So I feel like this was everywhere. Um, I hate this challenge. I hate this challenge so much, you guys. If you know me at all, you probably know that. Um, They're just really notorious for the all or nothing thinking, pushing people way too hard. And it's gained a lot of traction as a weight loss tactic. They say it was started to be mental toughness, which I just think there's still issues with that, right? Um, I do have a blog post I will link in the description of this where I dove into the 75 hard. I explain more of why I don't like it, why it's not healthy. I'll link that in the description. Um, you guys know, no food rules. That's what I recommend. That's what I teach and preach. And this is just the opposite. And I think this, yes, this is an extreme example, but this is what happens. And it causes you to be just so much more out of tune with your body. I do believe that a lot of people have good intentions when they start these things, but the end result is just not great. So highly don't recommend, but I think this also shows that Okay, when you see things on social media where people say, like, this is toxic or don't eat this because it's going to have XYZ effect, literally water can also, too much of a good thing is just too much of a good thing. So just kind of a reminder that when you see someone on social media saying, don't eat this, it's going to cause blah, 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 we need context, right? You might have heard the phrase, the dose makes the poison, and that's absolutely true. Water, super nourishing, right? Our bodies quite literally need that, but it can be toxic if we have too much. So I think that also just kind of 
puts things into perspective. Now, one thing I did also want to touch on with this story is the idea that a lot of people have been saying, oh, well, I'm doing the 75 soft, right? Where they are doing some of the stuff, but they're very loosey-goosey with it. They're very lenient. And while, yes, I think that's kind of a step in the right direction, I still don't recommend it. And I think that when you set these strict, like I should and shouldn'ts, right? You probably heard the phrase, don't should yourself. What if we just decided that these things make me feel good. I want to do more of them. And I think there is also this idea that there's a finish line with the 75 hard, which finish lines and setting goals, it can be helpful. But I just think that it can set you up to do things that you aren't truly benefiting from and you're just doing just because. Now, with that said, I don't think that setting goals or including things like that in your life is a bad thing. I don't recommend doing things, a ton of things at once, and that's a lot of times what the 75 hard and even the 75 soft does. So one thing that I really talk a lot about with my clients and anything that I'm you know, teaching and preaching is actually creating sustainable behavior change. I have gone down such a rabbit hole of learning about internal motivation and really creating that long-term sustainable behavior change. And one thing that you can do, you may have heard before, called habit stacking. Um, And then also just starting with a two-minute habit. So those are two things that you can do in this situation. So firstly, start with one thing. Don't overwhelm yourself. (laughs) I sound like a broken record. I feel like I say this all the time. Just start simple, right? The majority of people, when they start something new, we're so excited and we want to do all the things, but that just kind of creates this kind of like yo-yo effect where we're all in and then we stop, right? Hello diets, where we change all the things at once and then we just kind of stop doing them, right? To create sustainable behavior change, start with one thing rather than a billion things at once. That's the first thing. The second thing is start with that one habit and then you can add on to it. So with this kind of at a high level, I mean, I could do like a full video on this, but start with one thing that you do every single day. So let's say, for example, like getting a cup of coffee. Take that habit that you do every day and then stack something on top of it. So again, pick your one thing that you want to do. So if I say I want to journal, right, or I want to drink a a glass of water in the morning, you could then tack that on to when you go get coffee, right? That just makes things a little bit less ambiguous. And then you can also then you have this like stack that you're creating. So maybe you're trying to create a morning routine, which fun fact, our next story is about morning routines. But if you're trying to create a morning routine, then you can stack those things, right? So maybe you start with, I'm going to drink more water in the morning. Okay, so I'm going to have a glass of water. Then I'm going to journal or I'm going to move my body. I'm going to take a multivitamin, right? Could be any of those things. But that's how I recommend it. Honestly, that's what we have so much research for. Just Those are just like two small tidbits of tactics of behavior change. But that would be my recommendation instead of 75 hard or soft or whatever you want to call it. But that sucks. I, I feel bad for this girl. And I like I also don't like shame her or blame her because this is stuff that is touted to us all the freaking time. So heart goes out to her. I hope she's okay. I should look to see if there's any follow-up info going on about her. All right, guys. Story number two. <laughs> when will we not have a story about Barbie? I feel like for the past three, four weeks, there's always been a Barbie story. And this one does not disappoint. So This says, this Barbie-inspired morning routine will have you in your feels. So I thought this was interesting. There are a few undeniably great takeaways from the Barbie movie. So how do we implement some of the lessons from the Barbie movie in our everyday lives? Enter the Barbie-inspired morning routine. We're infusing, how we're infusing our daily lives with a little bit more Barbie from now on because, yes, our world has been changed. Uh, So here are the components of the Barbie morning routine that they recommend. Number one, romanticize waking up. 
do something you enjoy when you wake up in the morning. Number two is connect with someone you love, chat with the barista or text a loved one and feel the connection. Number three is eat breakfast that reminds you of being a kid. It says, it says every once in a while at a heart-shaped waffle with whipped cream. Let go of unrealistic expectations through, this is number four, journaling or affirmations. No one is ever going to be perfect or live up to the patriarchal expectations of society. Forgive yourself through journaling and find why not meeting those expectations makes you so amazing. And number five is embrace the variety of each day, no matter what your days are going to look different and things are going to happen. Go easy on yourself and remember that it's just life. So have you guys seen the Barbie movie? Leave a comment. Let me know your thoughts. I t- I talked about this in last week's uh, episode, so I won't go into too much detail on it, but I thought the there's so many great points of it, but I just thought it was so funny throughout. Like there's so many one-liners. Anywho, but I do remember seeing the morning scene, right? Where she wakes up. I mean, it is just like what you'd think a Barbie would wake up like everything's perfect. And it's just like this like totally idealistic thing. And I just thought this was a a good kind of like recap of that because I when I was watching, I felt like this is so unrealistic, like mornings don't go like that. And I think this is a great way to break it down into realistic ways to add some things to your morning routine. And I do think that morning routines are a great way to start the day. I have one. Um, I actually didn't do it today. So that's one thing to talk about here is that all or nothing thinking with morning routines. I feel like so often we get so rigid with them. And again, it's that all or nothing thinking. Either we do all of our morning routine all the time or we don't do any of it. Like I said, I didn't do my morning routine. I kind of think Thursdays are going to be a day where I don't usually do it because I'm getting to this and I want to pop this out as early as possible for you guys. Um, So I love I love all of these individual components. I really do. I think that the connection one is really good because I was reading a study the other day that was talking about the importance of human connection and the health improvements that can come from it. And I think that's one thing that when we're dieting, we miss out on a lot of social situations or those social situations cause us anxiety. And I just think that we always think about in terms of health, like the things that we put in our bodies or that we do with our bodies. But I think we so often forget about things like that. So that was one that really stuck out to me. Romanticize waking up. I don't know that that's ever going to be me, you guys. I roll out of bed and yeah, it's just, I don't think that's going to happen. So moral of the story, I think that you could take these things and if there is one that sticks out to you, try to implement it. I think the connection one is really good. And I'll be honest, it's something that I always have the best intentions of doing, reaching out to people. And it's something that falls to the wayside. And I think that that'd be super helpful. I do journal. So I have that one, but kind of going back to what we were talking about with the 75 hard using those habit stackings, pick just one thing, but I don't know, just thought that was fun. Okay. What will next week's Barbie story be? All right. Number three, I can't say this without laughing, but I've seen it everywhere. Number three says, will bed rotting actually make you feel better? Have you guys heard of this term bed rotting? Bed rotting has gone viral on TikTok, but the concept is nothing new. The term bed rotting essentially involves staying in bed all day by choice. Staying home in bed sick with the flu or a twisted ankle doesn't qualify, they explain. Instead, bed rotting consists of passive or unproductive activities like watching Netflix or online shopping, taking the entire day off to fully relax and rejuvenate from your bed. So, some people were saying like, hey, it's great. Other people were saying that bed rotting can be detrimental if it becomes a regular occurrence. Bed rotting can be a vicious cycle because the more time one spends in bed, the less they engage with the outside world and their responsibilities. Bed rotting can be beneficial under certain correct circumstances. So like I said, bed rotting, I feel like I've seen it floating around just like in TikToks and on Instagram. And it's a funny term. Like, let's not, let's not even pretend that. But 
And I do think that it's important to create an environment where it's okay to do nothing. And I think this comes from a variety of ways. A, like the 75 hard, right? That says you do uh, two workouts every day. Like I don't, you don't need to do two workouts every day. Um, But I think that with the, I can't say about that, it's bed rotting. I don't know why it's so funny to me. It does create, like, it's okay to do those things. And I do think that we sometimes need that push from A, we feel guilty from diet culture because a lot of times, like, we're not moving our body, you're being lazy, you're not, quote, unquote, earning your food, which is all bananas. But I also think it's interesting from, like, a hustle culture standpoint of view or just, like, our today's society where you can always be doing more, achieving more, and I 180% fall victim to that. I have a very, very hard time resting. And so I think that the talking about this stuff and saying like, it's okay, can be helpful. I do think, I mean, with anything, there's pros and cons, but I do kind of like what they said about it could cause you to kind of like self-isolate. And I think it's important to understand why are you bed rotting? Like, are you doing it because you just need a rest or are you doing it because you're feeling depressed? There's been times in my life post, um, it was, I think a senior year in college and like the summer after I stayed in bed for days. I was so incredibly depressed. This is when I was really, really struggling with food. And I, I remember literally just being in bed all day long and it wasn't a healthy thing for me. So I think that a, this is great that it gives us the permission to just rest or rejuvenate, do nothing. Because if there's one thing that I've also learned about playing around with rest is that you will always come back rejuvenated, right? I think, hello, YouTube is a good example of that. I took a long break from posting YouTube videos and I'm feeling so inspired and excited and it fills me up to come back to it. So don't, Rest is important. Rest is good. But one thing I also wanted to discuss was the different styles of rest, because this is something I had never thought about before, and I've been thinking about it a lot over the past few months, is that not everyone is going to rest in the same type of way. I am, a, if you haven't noticed, very, very high energy person. I do love me a good just like lay on the couch, veg out session. But I don't always find that rejuvenating and restful. I have, sometimes there's more like active rest. What type of rest do you need, right? Sometimes for me, rest is, still looks like doing something, but it's baking. One thing I love in terms of rest is I love, for me, I think I need to rest my mind. That is the biggest type of rest for me. And one thing I love doing is, Finding a delicious cake recipe, one that's going to take me like two to three hours to make. Shout out to Handle the Heat and Broma Bakery. They have really great recipes. And I just like spending a Saturday afternoon baking a cake. Yes, that's still doing something. You could argue that it's productive, but my mind is at rest. All I have to do is I don't have to think. I just have to follow directions. I don't have – no one needs me. That's a big thing, running a business. Like everyone is always needing you, which I love, but sometimes you need a break. And I don't have to come up with anything. The idea isn't mine. I just have to do it. And that I find so restful for me. So also just kind of wanted to talk about it's okay to have different types of rest. Um, It's absolutely okay if your type of rest is I need physical rest. I do think everyone needs physical rest. But sometimes I think just thinking about rest in a different or new way can also be really helpful. So I will, I'll look for it and I'll put it in the description. The Lazy Genius is a really great follow, Kendra. Uh, She has a podcast episode on a podcast or blog post. I'll look for it on the different types of rest. So if you're like, what are you talking about, Colleen? Like I, I get the concept of it, but I need more concrete examples. I will link that in the description for you guys. I thought it was really helpful because there's different types of rest that you're gonna need in different seasons of your life and depending on how you're feeling. Okay, story four, guys. Uh, I can't think of a Lunchable now without thinking of girl dinner or singing. I won't subject you to singing that song. I think I did that last week. Um, But here's the headline. 
Lunchables is heading to the produce aisle with fresh fruity snack trays. So it says the new offering of its popular packaged meal for the first time includes fresh cut fruits such as clementines, apples, pineapples, and grapes placed next to the typical crackers, cheese, and meat options. Theodore's coming downstairs. Can you guys hear him? Maybe not. Um, so I didn't realize, guys, do you want to come here, Theo? No? Okay. Uh, I didn't realize fresh fruit has quite literally never been in a Lunchable. Anywho, they say the fresh fruit tray is packed in a way so that the freshness of the fruit is preserved while the meat and cheese and crackers are also preserved. The brand is initially selling two varieties, ham and cheddar and then turkey and cheddar along with crackers combined with each of the four fresh fruit options with an aim to expand to a national rollout in 2024. So I don't believe that these are like you can go to the store and everyone can purchase everywhere right now. But I didn't I didn't even realize that fruit hadn't been there. And I won't lie, one of the things I thought it was like, the crackers are going to get like so soggy, but I should have known Lunchables has thought of that. Guys, I grew up, if you, I feel like if you grew up in the 90s or early 2000s, like you grew up with Lunchables. Lunchables were always the food that we would have if we had like a field trip or I don't know they're like special things for us mostly because they were a little bit more expensive than like just putting together a meal on your own um I love this idea I think it's a like I said I didn't realize that and I'm kind of like oh that's great now there are a couple things to consider is that the price is going to be higher so one thing I mentioned was we would we would only buy lunchables when they were on sale and it says that the price is going to be about 1 to 2 dollars higher than the normal and then another thing to consider consider is the shelf life is actually going to go from 110 days to for like the typical lunchables that we think about to about 10 days so 10 days is still a pretty good shelf life um it's not like SBE in that day, but that is a substantial decrease in shelf life. Um, so just kind of something to keep in mind. They do plan on rolling these out in school districts, but they have some, I think, tweaking to do because school district criteria for meals is very, very strict. When I was becoming a dietitian, one thing that you have to do is do what's called an internship. It's essentially kind of like how doctors – take residencies. They rotate through all the different areas and actually work in those areas. You have to do the same thing. So I was in a hospital. I was in the community. I was also in school foods. And it is bananas how many like very, very specific criteria that has to – talking about the – I feel like I just opened a can of worms talking about school food service. I feel like everyone feels very passionately about that, especially the almond moms of the world. But that's a whole other topic, you guys. We're not going to dive into that today. But one thing that I did want to talk about and has kind of been on my mind recently is this one to two dollars. I'm a very budget conscious person, you guys. I, if you don't know me, am just a Midwest gal. I, when I was growing up, when I was in college, I had four jobs just to get myself by. I do not have a fancy pants background. And Pinching pennies has always been something that I've done. Um, so whenever something is like a price increase or anything like that, I feel like it's something I typically pick up on. And so the Lunchables with Fresh Fruit are going to be $1 to $2 higher is going to be the recommended price point for it. And I think this comes to the conversation that a lot of times there is – a premium to eating quote unquote healthy. I was looking at me. I, <laughs> that dog loves a fur blanket. Anywho, um, there is a premium to quote unquote healthy eating. And I think this kind of shows it. And I think that's something a lot of people, when they're giving out nutrition advice, don't, okay, I'm putting my phone down because I'm going to talk with my hands. A lot of people don't consider that. And Someone on my Instagram post a couple days ago, I posted about how like you were at a doctor, a point of view, the doctor recommends a diet that doesn't work for you, blah, blah, blah. Someone commented and said, I understand where you're coming from, that diets don't work, but 
Would you, what would you say to someone who is eating fast food every day? They're considered to be overweight and they're just not healthy. My response was I would not focus on their weight, right? Weight neutrality and focusing on behaviors is so much more effective and we actually have it does improve health outcomes much more than a weight centric approach and trying to just focus on shrinking someone's body. So I would focus on their behaviors and I would ask, I would say, why are we eating fast food all day, every day? Not judgmentally, not like, why are you doing that? More so, is this something that the person only has access to? Is this something the person can only afford? Is the person's schedule so busy, they don't have time to get the fresh fruits and vegetables from a different grocery store because this is closest. There's so many things to consider about someone's food choices. And I just thought like that was one of the first things that popped into my mind when I saw that price increase, right? Or people will say like, I don't know, get certain type of crackers or something. But a lot of times that recommendation comes with a few dollar price increase. Now, if you're able to afford that, like you you might not think twice about that. But I do think it's an important thing, especially to anyone who is giving out, I'm in the world of nutrition. So especially like nutrition advice or even, I mean, any advice, I do think that accessibility, feasibility are all things that we need to consider. So I just thought that was kind of a an interesting point that I wanted to slide in there because that was one of the first things that came to mind. Overall, I love Lunchables. Um, I love the fruit edition, to be honest. I, I'm here for it. And I also didn't notice any language in the article, to my knowledge, of like candy's bad so we got to take that out it seems all like the messaging is very positive and not like fear-mongering of candy so bravo all right guys this last story is about kiki palmer she rejects unrealistic body standards following postpartum weight loss we had a story Jesse J was she our story last week about postpartum weight loss um so it says kiki palmer was the first to celebrate her curvy postpartum body. Now, five months after giving birth to her son, Leotis, I think that's how you say the name, the new mom is addressing the pressure celebrities face to snap back to their pre-pregnancy figures. Uh, Okay, so where is it? She points out all the privileges. Let me find it. Hold on. Okay, so she says, I love the part where she talks about like, don't feel the pressure to snap back. But this is actually why I chose this story. It says, Palmer pointed out that a snap back is often part of the damn gig. A part of our jobs is to look good and to look the part, she said. So don't think it's this thing where it's like we're doing it because we, we're doing it because we got it like that. Um, No, the job is on the line. If we want the checks to get signed, we got to be what we got to be. It's my job. Let's not get crazy. I don't want people thinking I am setting unrealistic standards, she said. I can afford a trainer, meal prep, a lot of things, and it's expensive, but I am investing in my career. So I think it's A, like we were just talking about with privileges, super important to address privileges. But I also think that, and while it's great to be transparent about that, and my first reaction to this was like, thank you for someone for saying that this is typically, I always think of Gwyneth Paltrow when she did that interview and she was like, I remember she was like, I spend two hours, I'm making stuff up, two hours sauning, dry brushing for an hour, doing, I'm like, okay, there's three hours of your day. I I need to start a petition to have more hours in the day. I don't have three hours to do that stuff. And I just think that like, it's important to recognize like this is not realistic for every person. And like I said, at first I was like, thank you for sharing that. But then I was like, why are we setting this precedence? Because I think that when you see people who are quote unquote successful, they have the financial means to do this stuff. They have the time to do this stuff. They have the help to do this stuff. It can kind of set the precedence that also to be successful, you have to be thin because 
that's their job to be thin. I think there's a whole lot to dig into here about the pre- why do we have that pressure on people who are quote unquote successful as celebrities? It's still, while it's nice to recognize it, it's still setting the precedence that when you are reach a certain level of success or fame, you have to look like this. So if someone wants to get to that level of success, they're going to try everything they can to do it, even if it's not feasible, even if it's not healthy, because we have that expectation of celebrities. And again, I think this is something that is changing. And people are like, I think last week, Jesse J was saying like, I'm not going to try to do this. And I think Kiki, Kiki was like Sam was saying, like, it's our job to do this. So I thought the stories from last week to this week were kind of different. They have kind of different points of views. And I think we need more people to say, my body's my body. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to respect it to the best of my ability. But I'm not going to try to still conform to something that I feel like I have to. Because otherwise, if we continue to do that, like nothing's ever going to change. Um, I do think it's probably, it's something, I mean, I've had clients in the society where I do all my teaching saying I am a actress. Like, how do I navigate this? And I do think there is a lot of pressure, a lot of things to consider, a lot of weighing how you feel your career stems on your body. And I think that's that like a whole other conversation to dive into. But yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting, thought provoking. Like I said, at first I was like, oh, it's so nice that someone's addressing this is not realistic. But I was like, but wait, why are we then having that standard for people? Also, when a lot of people don't address those things. So anywho, those were the five stories of this week, you guys. I would love to hear what your thoughts were on this more just casual, ch- casual chatty episode. Like I said, I've been doing these every single week for the past little while. I have a lot of fun doing them, just kind of chatting with you guys. So I would love to hear your take. Let me know in the comments. Be sure you are subscribed to the channel so you don't miss another video. Like I said, these come out every Thursday and at this time. And then YouTube videos are also going to come out, like I said, next week. We have one coming on Food FOMO, a little vlog. It's going to be fun. I'm actually going to shoot um, the last little clips of it today where I do a little sit down talking. But yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. I hope you have a great week and I'll see you next week. See you later.